भगवतो अर्हतो सम्मास नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सम्मास नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सम्मास so over here uh, we are uh, doing a sutta which is majjhima uh, nikaya 137 so this is the exposition of the six fold basis this is also a comprehensive sutta so uh, there is a lot of information given so i'll go by and uh, uh, there is not much clarification needed because we have gone through many of uh, uh, the suttas so most of the uh, words and uh, phrases you will be familiar with thus have i heard on one occasion the blessed one was living at savati jethas grove anatha pindika's park there he addressed the bhikkhus thus bhikkhus venerable sir they reply the blessed one said this bhikkhus i shall teach you an exposition of the six fold base listen and attend closely to what i have i shall say yes venerable sir the bhikkhus replied the blessed one said this the six internal bases should be understood the six external bases should be understood the, the six classes of consciousness should be understood this is very similar to what we uh, go through the chachaka sutta so this is uh, uh, but buddha used to uh, have different ways of uh, informing or teaching the same information or uh, the same uh, uh, teaching uh, based on his students or based on the occasion So this is a different way of uh, approaching this. The six classes of contact shall be understood. The eighteen kinds of mental exploration should be understood. Over here it deviates. The thirty-six positions of being should be understood. Therein, by depending on this, uh, therein by depending on this, abandon that. Depending on this, abandon that means like one person. Uh, goes up the stairs he depends on the higher uh, stair uh, to uh, let go of the lower uh, rug so after he goes up he can use that depending on that he goes higher so in that way he says uh, that by depending on this abandon that so you abandon what is inferior depending on what is superior there are three foundations of mindfulness that the noble one cultivates cultivating which the noble one is a teacher fit to instruct a group among the teachers of training it is he that he is called an the incomparable leader of persons to be tamed this is the summary of the exposition of the six fold base the internal the six internal bases should be understood so it was said and with reference to what was this said there are the eye base ear base nose base tongue base body base and the mind base so this is uh, in most of the or in all of the sutras you will find that the sequence of the bases are always the eye uh, the uh, the ear the nose the tongue and the body and then the mind so this is the sequence in all uh, of the sutras where it is mentioned so it was with the reference to this that it was said the six internal bases should be understood the six external bases should be understood so it was said and with reference to what was this said there are form base sound base odor base flavor base tangible base and the mind object base so it was with reference to this that it was said that the six external bases should be understood the six classes of consciousness should be understood so it was said and with reference to what was this said there are eye consciousness ear consciousness nose consciousness tongue consciousness body consciousness and mind consciousness so it was with reference to this that it was said the six classes of consciousness should be understood the six classes of contact should be understood so it was said and with reference to what was this said there are eye contact ear contact nose contact tongue contact body contact 
and mind content. So it was with reference to this, it was said the six classes of contact should be understood. The 18 kinds of mental exploration should be understood. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said? On seeing a form with the eye, one explores a form productive of joy. One explores a form productive of grief. One explores a form productive of equanimity. So over here, you have to pay attention. Uh, over here, what uh, it is saying is what happens upon contact. <laughs> On seeing an eye, uh, a, a form with the eye, one explores a form productive of joy. One uh, explores a form productive of grief. I like it. I don't like it. And one is equanimity. So that is the three kinds of reactions one gets when one sees a form. Say one sees a flower and he has a, uh, 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 which is, he is joyful at seeing the flower. And one sees something very ugly, then he is maybe a grief or he sees his broken uh, favorite uh, toy is broken. And he, uh, that is uh, 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 inducing grief. And one uh, may be equanimous at seeing something. Uh, it may be kind of, uh, uh, in, there are two uh, classifications for that. We'll go later. But uh, say if uh, somebody sees a sunset and uh, that may be uh, calming uh, to the person. <coughs> but that is based on the sunset. And uh, I would like uh, to tell that anybody can ask a question if, uh, in the reading of the sutta because it's a very long sutta. And uh, by coming back, uh, you may not have the time to kind of ask questions. So whenever uh, you want, you will be able to ask questions. OK? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Bante, I, I have a quick question. Uh -huh. because the, the clause uh, should be understood. Uh, is repeated again and again and again. Uh -huh. So uh, I just want to clarify that phrase for every class that's mentioned should be understood in, in what terms or in what context, whether it's the six, six internal base or the external base yeah. or the past. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, whenever Buddha is talking, he's talking about meditation, okay? So it should be understood in your meditation when somebody something comes up, or in your uh, daily life when something something comes up. Uh, uh, that is uh, why we say uh, Bhante Vimaramsi says uh, life is meditation and let meditation is life. You know, so everything which comes up uh, when you are uh, has have an investigative mind, then everything uh, is a uh, occasion for you to understand what is happening okay so that is uh, say if uh, certain things come up in your mind then uh, how do you understand that this that this is a mind object which has come up uh, that is it's just a thought so that's a mind object if you like that mind object you it, it gives you joy say uh, it is in the past something has happened uh, you were uh, with your parents and you had gone to a movie and that thought comes up in your mind and that uh, is uh, you that makes you happy so you understand this is what is happening the mind of Jupiter has come up so you have to understand whatever is there so it is in a in a way for whatever you are there you investigate it so whatever comes up you in, uh, investigate that thing so over here, what uh, I'll read one second. On seeing a form with the eye, one explores and form productive of joy. One explores a form productive of grief. One explores a form productive of equanimity. So over here, he, uh, Buddha is uh, informing us that how when you are seeing an object, uh, emotions are arising. So on hearing a sound with the ear, on hearing an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on tasting a tan, uh, on touching a tangible, tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with the mind. One explores a mind object productive of joy. One explores a mind object productive of grief. One explores a mind object productive of equanimity. Thus, there are six kinds of exploration 
with joy, six kinds of explorations with grief, and six kinds of exploration with equanimity. So each uh, there is six kinds. So it was with reference to this that it was said the 18 kinds of mental exploration should be understood. The 36 positions of being should be understood. So it was said and with reference to what was this said, there are six kinds of joy based on household life, six kinds of joy based on renunciation, six kinds of joy, six kinds of grief based on household life, six kinds of grief based on renunciation. There are six kinds of equanimity based on household life and six kinds of equanimity based on renunciation. Herein, what are the six kinds of joy based on household life? When one uh, regards as a gain, the gain of forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, gratifying, and associated with worldliness, or when one recalls what one formerly obtained that has passed, ceased, and changed, joy arises. Such joy as this is called joy based on household life. Why is this uh, based on household life? Because everything is connected to what is the physical in the worldly sense. So whenever a person uh, uh, has uh, something which gains, uh, he gains it something. Say he uh, wins a raffle and he wins a uh, phone, the latest uh, model of a phone. So he's happy that he has won this phone or he remembers that he had won a phone or a, a, tab a tablet or something like that. So he is happy, but his happiness is based on this object. Because that is based on his object, it is a household life, based on household life. When one regards as gain. And the, the other thing is that he's saying that if, when one regards as gain, so it's also a personal a point of view, perspective over here that if one is regarding this as a personal again, if some, uh, uh, one, uh, someone you give a, 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 say a, that same phone, but he did, uh, does not regard it as a gain for himself. He may uh, take it as a burden. So, like if you give a mobile phone to Bante, he will <laughs> basically uh, consider it a burden because he has to take care of it and uh, it has uh, uh, the possibility of disturbing him when he does not want to get disturbed. Somebody can call him at an hour when he does not want to take a call. So that is also a personal perspective of this is also that. When one regards as a gain, the gain of sounds cognizable by the ear, the gain of odors cognizable by the nose, the gain of flavors cognizable by the tongue, the gain of tangibles cognizable by the body, the gain of mind object cognizable by the mind that are wished for, desired, agreeable, gratifying, and associated with worldliness. Or when one recalls what was formerly obtained that has passed, ceased, and changed, joy arises. Such joy as this is called joy based on the household life. These are the kinds, the six kinds of joy based on the household life. Herein, what are the six kinds of joy based on renunciation? When by knowing the impermanence, change, fading away, and cessation of forms, one sees at it as it actually is with proper wisdom that forms both formally and now are all impermanent, suffering, and subject to change. Joy arises. So this is a joy which is based on wisdom. So when uh, somebody sees with wisdom the true nature, then he has joy which arises. Such joy as this is called joy based on renunciation. When by knowing the impermanence change, uh, fading away and cessation of sounds, of odors, of flavors, of tangibles, of mind objects, one sees at it as, as it actually is with proper wisdom that mind objects both formally and now are all impermanent, suffering and subject to change, joy arises. Such joy as this is called joy based on renunciation. These are the six kinds of joy based on renunciation. Hearing what are the six kinds of grief 
based on household life. When one regards as a non-gain, the non-gain of forms cognizable by the I that are wished for, desired, agreeable, gratifying, associated with worldliness. That is non-gain means you, know, you want a, a, a mobile or a laptop, but you cannot get it. Or you want an ice cream or you want uh, to listen to a music by Mozart or anything which is there. That is the non-gain that you have not been able to get it. Or when one recalls what was formerly not attained, that has passed, ceased, and changed. Grief arises, such grief as this is called grief based on the household life. When one regards as a non-gain, the non-gain of sounds cognizable by the ear, the non-gain of odors cognizable by the nose, the non-gain of flavors cognizable by the tongue, the non-gain of tangible cognizable by the body, the non-gain of mind object cognizable by the mind that are wished for, desired, agreeable, gratifying, and associated with worldliness. Or when one recalls what was formerly not obtained, that has passed, ceased, and changed, and grief arises. Such grief as this is called grief based on the household life. These are the six kinds of grief based on the household life. So anything which is material and which is uh, basically uh, has the three characteristics and that three characteristics, uh, uh, whatever is the uh, object will always uh, be uh, impermanent. It will uh, have uh, uh, the element of Dukkha and it is impersonal. So that three characteristics, if it's, uh, anything is there, it, it will not be a permanent uh, thing which you can enjoy. So uh, the, the gain is also uh, something which is not uh, you can keep. Even the loss is something which uh, is something which is not a correct thing because that was always going to go away. So herein, what are the six kinds of grief based on renunciation? When by knowing the impermanence, change, fading away, and cessation of forms, one sees that it actually is with proper wisdom that forms both formally and now are all impermanent, suffering and subject to change. One generates a longing for the supreme liberations thus. When shall I enter upon and abide in that base that the noble ones now enter upon and abide in? In one who generates thus a longing for the supreme liberations, grief arises. With that longing as conditions, such grief as this is called grief based on renunciation. So when you have a longing for something, but that longing is for the Nibbana, the element of Nibbana, then there, there is a grief, but that is a grief based on renunciation. When by uh, knowing the impermanence, change, fading away, and cessation of sounds, of odors, of flavors, of tangibles, of mind objects. One sees at it as it actually is with proper wisdom that mind objects both formally and now are all impermanent, suffering, and subject to change. One generates a longing for the supreme liberations thus. When shall I enter upon and abide in that base that the noble ones now enter upon and abide in? In one who thus generates a longing for the supreme liberations, grief arises with that longing as condition. Such grief as this is called grief based on renunciation. These are the six kinds of grief based on renunciation. Wherein there are six kinds of equanimity based on the household life. On seeing a form with the eye, equanimity that arises in a foolish, infatuated, ordinary person. So here, here uh, the equanimity is uh, not having the wisdom element in it. So when an ordinary person, that means that the person has not been instructed in the Buddha's teaching. Uh, he is untaught. He has not been uh, taught about the uh, true nature. 
is an untaught ordinary person who has not conquered his limitations or conquered the results of actions and who is blind to danger. Such equanimity as this does not transcend the form. That is why it is called equanimity based on the household life. So over here, the equanimity is there, but the equanimity is still based on the fact that it is One day. The, something which is impermanent, which can uh, create dukkha. And One day, I think uh, Hugh want to ask a question. He raised yes, his yes. hand twice. Yes. Who is asking yeah. the question? Yeah, his mic is muted. Hugh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Bhante. Um, yes, I was trying to ask a question about the previous paragraph, so I, I think I'm going to interrupt the flow. So do you want to just continue or, no, or take Okay, it? you can ask her. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so we had uh, equanimity, uh, we had uh, impermanence creating joy, but we also had impermanence creating longing. Um, what, is the, what is the state of mind? What's the difference between that? Because you're seeing the same thing. You're seeing the impermanence, but one creates longing, one creates joy. And what is the process, if you like, of moving between those? See, one, uh, one is the process where, uh, say, uh, if somebody is there, uh, say, I think I'll give you an example of me uh, in meditation, okay? So somebody sees something which is uh, kind of constantly bothering him, okay? And then uh, at, at a point of time, he re realizes that, oh, this is not me, this is not mine. Uh, and this this is, uh, is uh, it, it was not there before it came and it will go away and at that point of he is able to let it go then that time uh, a joy arises in that person okay when he okay. does this uh, for a couple of times then he uh, realizes that there is a state of mind in a noble one that this uh, kind of hindrances does not arise mm -hmm. And he wants to be that person. So that is the okay. longing which is there. Then it uh, generates the longing. But this is a kind of a higher kind of a longing. Uh, the uh, Buddha says that it is like uh, having an address for a certain thing. Uh, so this longing is something when you reach the Nibbana, then you cannot have this longing. And say so it's like a, an address for an uh, location where you go there, that address uh, which is there in your hand is worthless at that time. That time you cannot have an attachment also if you wanted to have. So you let go of that, uh, that piece of paper and you have arrived at the uh, destination. So this longing is a higher uh, form of longing. So how, how do you work with that sense of longing? You uh, make it a uh, kind of a guiding light for you to practice. So, I, I couldn't quite hear that. So uh, please say that again. You make that an inspiration or a guiding light okay. for your practice. Okay. Or, or is it that you forget okay. about the past and move on? Don't don't think about the past. Yeah, that is a different uh, uh, mindset. Don't think about the past and uh, you can move on. But over here, uh, what we are saying is that if a person has a, an understanding, a joy, <coughs> uh, but he wants that joy to be permanent, okay? So he knows that there is a there are noble ones who have this joy and they can permanently keep this joy. So he has a, a desire uh, generate in him that he also wants to be that uh, position. So when he does that, he creates a longing, but that longing is painful because it, you have uh, are uh, wanting something that is not in your grasp. But that can be an inspiration for you to practice. So if you are not able to get up at five o'clock in the morning uh, to meditate, but if that longing arises, that longing can be an inspiration for you to get up in the morning at five and uh, sit for a half an hour more or an hour more. There uh, is a uh, bureaucrat in uh, Russia, uh, Bante student. He gets up at, uh, I think, uh, four or something like that and sits for three hours uh, and before going to office. So uh, he has this longing to uh, progress. He is a very advanced student. 
So he has this longing to go to the next uh, stage. Isn't it a craving, Bande? It is a craving. It's a type of craving, yes. But it's a type of craving. This is, it is said to be the last craving you will have. That's the reason it is like an address slip. But this craving is not a very heavy craving. It is like a, a craving for a, a address slip. But when you reach the destination, that craving you cannot uh, no longer have. So when you say uh, attain Nibbana, then you will not have a, a craving for Nibbana. And there will not be any other craving. So if you had to ha get attached to something, this is the craving you have to get attached to. Thank right? you, uh, like the joy they, uh, they say that is there if there is any joy you have to get attached to, equanimity is the joy you have to get attached to. Because that is the most uh, based on wisdom, that is based on the Buddha's teaching, not based on household, the equanimity. So if, if you want to get attached to something, get uh, attached to joy, which is the joy of, which comes from meditation. So in the higher, uh, in this thing also, as uh, he says, uh, the Buddha says that it's like a step, you know, if you are on the joy, then you use equanimity to abandon joy. And that is the same thing which happens when you are in infinite consciousness, you are in joy. When you abandon infinite uh, consciousness and go into equanimity, you abandon joy and step into equanimity. So in this way, you kind of uh, trade something which is uh, of lower quality for a higher quality. There's a uh, story the Buddha says about a person who finds uh, abandoned cotton. So he takes the abandoned cotton and start walking. Then he finds that there is abandoned uh, steel there. So he throws away the cotton and picks up the abandoned steel. When he finds that there are abandoned silver over available over there, so he throws away the steel and takes the silver. Then uh, later on, he finds abandoned gold. So he throws away the silver and takes up the gold and reaches his destination. So in that way, you take up something which is uh, superior and give up which is inferior. So that is the simile which has been given. So in the same way, and, uh, and there is some explanation in the sutta also. So it is very interesting. You can, uh, I'll uh, start uh, with the sutta once again. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with the mind, equanimity arises in a foolish, infatuated, ordinary person, in an untaught ordinary person who has not conquered I have done this. No, okay, I have gone back. Equanimity based on household life. These are the six kinds of. Herein, what are the six kinds of equanimity based on renunciation? When by knowing the impermanence, change, fading away, cessation of forms, one sees at it as it actually is with proper wisdom forms both formally and now are all impermanent, suffering and subject to change. Equanimity arises. Such equanimity as this transcends the form. That is why it is called equanimity based on renunciation. So it was with, uh, when by knowing the impermanence, change, fading away, and cessation of sounds, of odors, of flavors, of tangibles, of mind objects, one sees as it actually is with proper wisdom that mind objects both formally and now are all impermanent, suffering and subject to change. Equanimity arises. Such equanimity as that transcends the mind object. That is why it is called equanimity based on renunciation. These are the six kinds of equanimity based on renunciation. So it was with reference to this that it was said the 36 positions of being should be understood. Wherein, by depending on this, abandon that. So again, this uh, phrase is coming. Therein, by depending on this, abandon that. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said? Here, because by depending and relying on six kinds of joy, 
based on renunciation abandon and surmount the six kinds of joy based on the household life so by depending on the training and by uh, the joy which you generate on the basis of wisdom which is in meditation but i i hesitate to say in meditation itself because life is meditation and meditation life what you are by right effort what you are doing has to be there in your daily life also so that daily life whatever you are doing but by doing your uh, right effort in your daily life you are bringing wisdom into all activities and all uh, what, what you do so that is the practical uh, application of sati pathana that is the way you depend so by uh, i'll read this one second here because by depending and relying on the six kinds of joy based on renunciation abandon and surmount the six kinds of joy based on household life it is thus they are abandoned it is thus they are surmounted by depending and relying on the six kinds of grief based on renunciation abandon and surmount the six kinds of grief based on the household life in the same way the grief also of renunciation is used as a tool to inspire yourself to abandon the household griefs it is thus they are surmounted by depending and relying on the six kinds of equanimity based on renunciation abandon and surmount the six kinds of <coughs> equanimity based on the household life it is thus they are abandoned it is thus they are surmounted by depending and relying on the six kinds of joy based on renunciation abandon and surmount the six kinds of grief based on renunciation it is thus they are abandoned it is thus they are surmounted by depending and relying on the six kinds of equanimity based on renunciation abandon and surmount the six kinds of joy based on renunciation it is thus they are abandoned it is thus it is thus they are surmounted so in uh, the wisdom also you take the higher wisdom to abandon which is of the lower quality there is because equanimity that is diversified based on di diversity and there is equality that is unified based on unity and what because is equality that is diversified based on diversity there is equality regarding forms sounds orders flavor flavors and tangible this because is equanimity that is diversified based on diversity and what because is equanimity that is diversified based on unity there is equanimity regarding the base of infinite space the base of infinite consciousness the base of nothingness and the base of neither perception nor non perception this because equanimity that is unified based on unity so in equanimity also uh, the buddha is uh, advocating to take the higher equanimity which is based on your meditation because by depending and relying on non identification abandon and surmount equanimity that is unified based on unity it is thus this is abandoned it is thus this is surmounted because by depending and relying on non identification abandon and surmount equanimity that is unified so I, there is a book here the note so i'll just read that note i uh, i'm also not so clear the ma maybe that is the commentary says that non identification atam yata here refers to insight leading to emergence the insight immediately preceding the arising of the super mundane path for this affects the abandonment of equanimity of the immaterial attains and the equanimity of insight so i would need a little more research into this uh, aspect but non identification is like uh, understanding the impersonal nature 
of what is uh, uh, what is arising. So in equanimity also you do not identify with what is arising. And this is uh, based on uh, the uh, place you are there just before you attain uh, awakening. It is thus this is abandoned. It is thus this is surmounted. So it was in reference to this that it was said therein by depending on this abandon that. So the Buddha is saying that by uh, abandoning the inferior you uh, by uh, uh, depending on the uh, uh, superior you abandon the inferior. So this is the way of progressing. There are three foundations of mindfulness that the noble one cultivates, cultivating which the noble one is a teacher fit to instruct a group. So it was said and with reference to what this, uh, what was this said. So this is about how, uh, what are the qualities a good teacher should have. And this is also uh, 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 talking about the qualities which uh, the Tathagata, that Buddha has uh, as a teacher. Here, uh, because compassionate and seeking their welfare, the teacher teaches the Dhamma to the disciples out of compassion. This is for your, your welfare. This is for your happiness. His disciples do not want to hear or give ear or ex exert their mind to understand. They err and turn aside from the teacher's dispensation. With that, the Tathagata is not satisfied and feels no satisfaction, yet he dwells unmoved, mindful and fully aware. Even though he is not satisfied, the Tathagata, he is not, uh, uh, he, he is not moved, his mind is fully aware. This bhikkhu is called the first foundation of mindfulness that the noble one cultivates, cultivating which the noble one is a teacher fit to instruct a group. Furthermore, because compassionate and seeking their welfare, the teacher teaches the Dhamma to the disciples out of compassion. This is for your welfare. This is for your happiness. Some of his disciples will not hear or give ear or <clears throat> exert their mind to understand. They err and turn aside from the teacher's dispensation. Some of his disciples will hear and give ear and exert their minds to understand. They do not err and turn aside from the teacher's dispensation. With that, the Tathagata is not satisfied and feels no satisfaction. And he is not dissatisfied and feels no dissatisfaction. Remaining free from both satisfaction and dissatisfaction, he dwells in equanimity, mindful and fully aware. This bhikkhu is called the second foundation of mindfulness that the noble one cultivates, cultivating which the noble one is a teacher fit to instruct a group. Furthermore, because compassionate and seeking their welfare, the teacher teaches the Dhamma to the disciples out of compassion. This is for your welfare. This is for your happiness. His disciples will hear and give ear and exert their minds to understand. They do not err and turn aside from the teacher's dispensation. With that, the Tathagata is satisfied and feels satisfaction, yet he dwells unmoved, mindful, and fully aware. This because is called the third foundation of mindfulness that the noble one cultivates, cultivating which the noble one is a teacher fit to instruct a group. So it was with reference to this that it was said, there are three foundations of mindfulness that the noble one cultivates cultivating which the noble one is a teacher fit to instruct a group. Among the teachers of training, it is he that is called the incomparable leader of persons to be tamed. So it was said, and which the reference to what was this said, Guide, guided by the elephant tam tamer, because the elephant to be tamed goes in one direction, east, west, north or south, guided by the horse, tamer because the horse to be tamed goes in one direction east west north or south guided by the ox tamer because the ox to be tamed goes in one direction east west north or south because guided by the tathagata accompanied and fully enlightened the 
person to be tame goes in eight directions so the uh, the more information is given in the next sutta 138 possession uh, possessed of material forms he sees forms this is the first direction not perceiving forms internally he sees forms externally this is the second direction he is resolved only upon the beautiful this is the third direction with the complete surmounting of perception of forms with the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact with non attention to perceptions of diversity aware that space is infinite he enters upon and abides in the base of infinite space this is the fourth direction by completely surmounting the base of infinite space Aware that consciousness is infinite, he enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. This is the fifth direction. By completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, he enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. This is the sixth direction. By completely surmounting the base of nothingness, he enters upon and abides in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. This is the seventh direction. By completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, he enters upon and abides in the cessation of perception and feeling. This is the eighth direction. That is the nibbana or uh, the stage after which you experience nibbana, the cessation. Because guided by the tathagata, accompanied and fully accomplished and fully enlightened, the person to be tame goes in this eight direction. So as we are teaching you, as uh, say Bhante teaches or the sister Kema teaches or any other teacher teaches, and we are teaching the words of the Buddha. So when uh, a person uh, hears it, follows it, then he progresses it. And this is seen in our retreats. So whoever is the teacher, the progress of the students remains uh, there. There, uh, There is some progress that the students are able to gain. Because the words which are using the, the process which are using is the uh, process which is given by the Buddha. Because guided by the Tathagata, accomplished, accomplished and fully enlightened, the person to be tame goes to this eight direction. So it was with reference to this, that it was said among the teachers of training, it is he that is called the incomparable leader of persons to be tame. This is what the blessed one said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the blessed one's word. So this is the end of the sutta. And we will be open for questions. Hello, Bhante. Yes. I, have a I have a question. Um, yeah. The, the sutta is, is describing very uh, succinctly how we replace a, a lesser state with a higher state. Now, I, one of the ways that we, uh, in TWIM, uh, the invitation is simply to be aware and these states will gradually uh, evolve because of our awareness. This replacing of a, a lesser state with a higher state is described here. So moving from the grief to the joy to the equanimity and then um, from unity to non-identification. Are we describing here something which is a natural process as a consequence of the practice? It's a, a natural process, but it is also a process where uh, uh, one does not hinder oneself. Say like uh, somebody uh, likes joy. Okay, he is there in uh, say infinite consciousness and likes to be in infinite consciousness because at, at some point in time, uh, th there was a, a feeling that uh, the joy was uh, not there in one's life. And he kind of uh, clings on to that joy. So what is he doing is uh, because uh, there is a equanimity in that uh, state also, but he does not depend on that equanimity or let it naturally come so that he can go to the equanimity and go to the nothingness, there uh, a progress can stall. So in that way, uh, th there is a, a possibility that it can naturally come, but uh, when uh, uh, you pay attention, that over here, uh, attention is the nutriment. 
so when you pay attention to certain uh, aspects in your meditation then you have to understand that that is become your hindrance and when that becomes your hindrance that has your uh, reveals where your attachment is so then when you know that is at, uh, your attachment then you, it is a easier process for you to abandon it because you know that the whatever you are attached to is is impermanent by a uh, kind of being against what is coming you are uh, creating dukkha and then this which arises is also imp impersonal so what has arrived the attachment itself is a impersonal process so uh, as i have, i have explained before that uh, uh, just kind of possessing something like a cup you know if i possess this cup then i have a, a thing that this is my cup and there is, this is a cup there is difference in how i deal with this cup because it is my cup or it's a cup so just uh, by having that uh, clarity can i kind of uh, 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 help you kind of get rid of the attachment i'll, I'll tell you about one uh incidents uh, we were there in ajay sumedho uh, kuti and that kuti was named after ajay sumedho uh, ajan uh, uh, sorry ajan <laughs> sumedho not ajay uh, so ajan sumedho is a senior monk and uh, he was the one who started vatpanana chat in thailand so uh, uh, so somebody had made a kuti whenever he comes or uh, he can stay in that kuti so when we were there and meeting uh, and we were talking to him in this kuti he said that uh, this uh, is a kuti it is not my kuti i don't have any legal rights to it somebody names this kuti ajan sumedho kuti that does not make it uh, my kuti if i have attachment to this kuti and somebody else comes and stayed over here then i will have dukha because that attachment which is there is just in the way you get uh, pay attention to what is there even if this kuti is in his name and it is there for his uh, whenever arrive he arrives in vatpanana chat in thailand he stays over there still he has no attachment to that and by having no attachment to that he kind of avoids the dukha which is associated with something which is uh, associated with possession which is loss So if he never comes back or it uh, is uh, destroyed in a rainstorm or something like that, he avoids that dukkha because he has that understanding that it is a kuti. One other uh, 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 example they give is this is a cup. This cup is already broken. So the example is given that this cup is already broken because this has intrinsic. property of impermanence even if this is not broken in my lifetime some lifetime somewhere this cup will be broken we, we cannot say that this cup will not be broken at one point in time this cup will be broken so the cup is already broken so you understand the intrinsic property of uh, the impermanence of this cup one other person uh, one uh, uh, osho uh, was uh, telling a story uh, the a, a, a sufi uh, saint goes to a king and says that uh, uh, who are you he said you are uh, you are a sufi saint i am respecting you and why are you asking me who i am so uh, uh, I, uh, the sufi asked once again who are you he says i am the owner of this uh, uh, this thing uh, palace i am such and such so he said but i came some years back and some other person was there over here sitting and he was saying that he was the owner of the palace so the intrinsic nature of this is mine possession personal is uh, there with the object but even if when a person is dissolved and uh, has to move on that object remains so how can you possess that object so that is a impersonal nature of uh, everything which is there you understand so then that by understanding that impersonal nature you kind of abandon that attachment to that 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, you are in blue typing somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Bante, I have a question on the 36 positions of being. So am I correct that uh, when it comes to the six kinds of joy uh, for household life and renunciation and six kinds of grief for household life and renunciation, there is an element of craving behind it? Uh, there is an uh, not just craving, it's an uh, element of... Uh the wisdom wisdom part of it so wisdom part of it is, is the uh, the uh, uh, knowing of the arising and the following of the things knowing of the uh, four uh, noble truths okay and knowing of the three characteristics that is the wisdom part of it so when a person is attached to something the attachment is without any wisdom so they cannot gain anything from it that is the household uh, predicament so uh, a householder can go around and uh, possess uh, a lot of uh, physical objects. But by possessing those physical objects, he does not gain in the wisdom. But when a, a renunciant uh, renounces an object, he renounces an object based on these three characteristics. But that does not mean that he cannot use the objects. Like I, I cannot see well without this glass. So I will possess this glass. I cannot uh, uh, save myself from uh, cold, heat, wind uh, without this robe. So then that robe is a possession. But intrinsically, we have a kind of uh, 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 taught by the Buddha that you have to use anything which you are using by understanding the intrinsic nature of it. So while using also a uh, food, you, uh, you uh, remember that this food is just for the health, not for uh, uh, the taste, not for the, uh, the flavor, not for the beautification, only for the maintenance and uh, health of the body, for uh, getting the holy life, uh, forwarding the holy life, we use the food. So there is a reminder given to us that anything which is there, which is uh, a physical nature, has these three characteristics and we are using this wisdom with, with the uh, understanding of this wisdom. So that enhances our uh, uh, understanding as we go along. In a household life, that understanding is not that. In the grief also, <clears throat> when uh, it is based on renunciation, that grief is also has wisdom in it. When it is for the uh, uh, the, uh, the the kind of longing for nibbana, longing to be uh, free of the uh, attachments. Okay, thank you, Bhatti. Any other questions? Okay, then uh, if there are no questions, then uh, we'll. Uh, uh, and over here, yes, yes. Uh, Bante, uh, can I ask something that's not related to the sutta tonight? Yes, yes, anything. Yeah. Uh, it's it kind of came from a reflection where, uh, because I saw recently postings of the talks by um, both of enlightenment, which is great. Uh, your, uh, you, you, there was a. Uh, uh, I missed uh, what you said because there was a kind of a, the it, it interrupted. Can you repeat? Oh, okay. So I noticed that there recently were some videos posted on the seven factors of enlightenment, uh, both by Bhante Vimala Ramsey and Sister Kema, which is uh, excellent, very clear. Um, then uh, a thought occurred to me that is very specific to um, a, uh, that's very helpful for someone who is, um, in essence, kind of has a certain level of faith or is um, somewhat on the path. What about uh, when we talk about a person who has no inclination 
towards even developing um, Ghana uh, or Sila right from the beginning? Is there such a thing as, you know, these are the factors to enable uh, such a person to develop the qualities of Dana Sila Bhavna? Yeah, uh, I think there are some certain suttas where uh, the Buddha mentions that there is an inclination of mind. So uh, uh, the basic uh, factor is one person is uh, 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 experiences dukkha. So there are two reactions to that uh, dukkha. One reaction is there is a distraction he one seeks. So he wants to get away from the dukkha. So there, there is a separation or a distraction which one seeks. And the other is uh, the person asks a fundamental question, uh, how this did, did happen? Tell me some one or two lines at least of why this uh, I am getting this dukkha. So I can get rid of this dukkha. So that uh, mindset is the mindset of investigation. So there is a cause and effect. So I want to know uh, uh, the, uh, the cause of this. So that mindset is the fundamental start of the journey of a person. So one of the suttas also says that uh, when you, uh, uh, the start of uh, this thing starts with uh, having good friends. When you have good friends, you will listen to the good Dhamma. Okay. So that is how it starts. But if that inclination is not there, then you cannot force somebody to, uh, somebody to do. It is, it's, a, it's a kind of a deeply personal journey. So one person has dukkha and has a different reaction. One person has a dukkha and has a different reaction. So that reaction is the thing. So one thing uh, you have to, I, I was just uh, uh, observing uh, uh, or kind of uh, contemplating that somebody who cannot sit in meditation can at least uh, uh, follow the five precepts. He says that I, I don't have time or I, I, I get distracted or uh, something or the other. So he can uh, uh, at least follow the five precepts. Uh, somebody who cannot follow the five precepts can at least give dana. So uh, the dana is the most uh, easiest thing a person can do. Because for, for following the precepts also, there is a denial of self. There is an instinct to kill. There is an instinct to uh, take away something which you like, which is not given. Uh, then uh, uh, the, uh, the sexual misconduct, the speech, and uh, intoxicants. These are the things which are there in life, and you have to deny yourself all those things. So some person who cannot do that can still do dana. So the person, uh, the minimum uh, start point the Buddha has given is dana. So dana, shila, bhavana. So when a person can renunciate, can renunciate a, a certain thing which is a physical object which he has attachment to for money or uh, time or uh, his uh, speech or as Bhante said, starts with a smile. But that is also an effort one takes of uh, giving away the smile, okay? That is a start point. When he has a uh, inclination of the mind which starts with giving dana and dana also has merits and merits at a certain point of time has uh, some kind of ridiculous amount of uh, uh, returns, which is uh, explained by the Buddha. Now that return cannot come in the, uh, the uh, way of physical way. Like if you want to understand this, uh, because I, I am kind of interested in dana and all these things, there is a person who is working with the, uh, his uh, workers, a contractor. And there is a bhikkhu who comes along and he says, okay, I will give him the food. The bhikkhu happens to be a pacheka buddha. So he gives the food to the bhikkhu. The bhikkhu goes uh, on his way and then he has a thought, oh, this uh, food I could have given, uh, distributed among my workers. Then uh, because of the merit of just giving one time food to a uh, pacheka buddha, uh, the uh, person uh, gets reborn in uh, as a wealthiest person in the uh, kingdom for 12 times. But because he had a thought that I should have not given uh, the food after he had given. Because of that, what it happens is that after his uh, death, all of this money 
reverts back to the state to the king because he does not have any heirs uh, he does not have any uh, children to uh, bequeath this his uh, wealth to so this is the amount of uh, kind of uh, uh, just uh, considering that uh, he gets uh, uh, 12 times the richest person in the uh, kingdom just by giving once the dana so somebody who gives dana regularly to the uh, sangha see the in the, uh, the hierarchy of things a pacheka buddha there is more uh, uh, merit to give to a buddha and uh, more merit than the buddha is to give to the sangha okay so when a person gives uh, uh, dana to the sangha and he gives it repeatedly then the merits which come does not come in the fashion of worldly things it comes in the fashion of uh, uh, the factors of enlightenment so as you go along it comes in the factor of uh, 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 inclining you towards the nibbana so that merit is in that uh, fashion so dana is a starting point so if the person is not inclined to even do dana then uh, we cannot do anything because it's a personal journey the dana if it is given <coughs> sorry from one own uh, uh, self and with a, a mind as you as i uh, explained to you the mindset is also very important you give it the pure mind it has much more benefit even if it was given with a impure mind there was benefit because the receiver was fulfilling the the transaction so if the receiver is taking without with a, without a good mind he is not a uh, good person and he uh, receives it improperly and the giver gives it improperly then there is no merit but the receiver receives it so the, uh, the there is merit in that so that is the uh, starting point so you start with dana then you incline yourself to correct your uh, personal habit shila shila can be refined then when shila is refined the bhavana uh, part becomes easy uh, bante vivaram uh, uh, tells a story about a, a woman who comes uh, to him in uh, malaysia for a meditation retreat she has not uh, done any meditation in his life and the first time she uh, sits she sits for one hour so the when in the interview bante ask uh, how much do you sit she said i sat only for one hour so bante said why only one hour he she said i had a uh, uh, pain in my legs i am not uh, used to sitting on the floor then bante said okay sit on the chair the next time she sat for four hours then she uh, bante kind of inquired and cross questioned her and found out from other people also that this person keeps her precepts so this person was somebody who kept her precepts uh, uh, and it is the first time she comes to the meditation and that comes out as uh, this uh, meditation being very easy for her so there is a, a link on this thing uh, where uh, by uh, doing dana you uh, uh, you kind of uh, incline yourself to shila by improving shila that improves your uh, meditation bhavana and uh, when you refine your bhavana then that re- uh, leads to the uh renunciation of uh, all uh, attachments and that is nibbana so that is how it progresses <laughs> okay any other questions any uh, unrelated question also auntie can i can i ask something there yeah. uh, thank you may for that question because uh, that's uh, uh, just brought uh, um a look at something coming up in my mind as well you were talking about the inclination of mind and uh, the reaction to dukkha could you just say a little bit more around the two uh, reactions to dukkha so for the mind that's not inclined to investigation how is that how does that how does that mind relate to dukkha see uh, uh, when a person uh, has any reactions it is based on his perception on uh, this thing Uh, any uh, situation and that perception is based on history so that history is uh, something which you do not have access to incomplete uh, like uh, the lifetimes uh, you may have lived previously uh, the buddha tries to explain in many many suttas he tries to explain many many different ways 
he says that only the uh, tears which you have spent for your relatives if you, that was to be collected then uh, a ocean all the oceans on the world uh, would be uh, filled uh, by your tears if uh, only your bones were to be collected uh, then it would be uh, bigger than the uh, mount everest on all those uh, different types of uh, explanations he gives if there are four uh, people sitting bhikkhus sitting and uh, re recollecting 100000 previous lifetimes as humans then uh, for 100 years they will be sitting but still they will not complete their task so these are the ways of uh, uh, showing that the past which is there the past uh, accumulated karma can be in a very complicated manner uh, appearing at this current period of time so that is the reason uh, uh, the uh, uh, Bhante also says that we are not in why, why this happened, but how it is happening currently. And only we can uh, respond to what is happening currently uh, and what uh, uh, we do currently will be creating our future. So a person uh, who has a reaction, we cannot uh, uh, by definition say uh, why this is happening unless it's a Buddha. Unless there's a Buddha over here, not even an Arahant who has who can read minds can uh, do that. It requires a vast amount of uh, insight to understand Kamma and the karmic reaction. So that is uh, the thing. So uh, uh, there is a simple things like uh, uh, giving strawberries to uh, children. Uh, you can find it in YouTube. First time a, a child has strawberry. One uh, child likes the strawberry, one child starts crying, one child is not uh, kind of uh, makes a funny face. So just a strawberry which is there has different reactions from somebody who uh, is considered a, a clean slate as per the science, you know, a child. So this is how uh, uh, each person has that uh, uh, accumulated library and that uh, lens which is perception and through that lens everything is seen so we kind of see how i am reacting now and then adjust and that uh, process of adjusting is have a uh, uh, goal and have a process that is the uh, goal is you can have uh, your breath or you can have uh, sending metta as your goal as your goal post as your anchor and the right effort the six hours as the process and then you uh, are able to uh, understand how this is happening where are your attachments where is your attachments what is hindering you hindering is a friend then why is a friend it sh shows you your attachments when you have an attachment you know that this is impersonal this is not me this attachment is not mine and this is also an impersonal and when when is it creating dukkha when i am butting heads against it uh, uh, if, if I have a headache, the headache is not the dukkha. My uh, uh, fighting with the headache, that is the dukkha. So would this, would this um, relate to, because we've got the um, sort of the two darts and we've got this uh, physical pain and mental pain. And the, in the sutta, it describes that uh, for someone who doesn't have a practice as we're describing here, um, the only solution to uh, the physical or mental pain is um, to try and find something pleasant as a distraction. And so this is the process of working with dukkha is, is the constant uh, seeking of uh, a, a, a pleasant distraction away from the dukkha. Um, and uh, so this then becomes the inclination of the mind to move in that direction. Whereas what I feel you're describing here is the inclination of the mind is uh, to be curious about why the dukkhas has ar ar arisen and to look at that rather than to avoid it or to suppress it or to um, distract ourselves away from it. Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Bandit. Okay. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so sorry about it, this further, but 
in relation to that strawberry um, example, how would this relate to, I'm going back to the dependent origination on the first section on uh, the potential uh, on, the, on the Sankara and the Vijnana. So uh, we're there, uh, as we are taught to understand, Sankara is the formation, the preparation, the potential for that formation to arise. And the consciousness is the pool of consciousness. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand how- uh, So that it is uh, very easy. Uh, see, uh, there is a tongue, there are flavors in uh, uh, the uh, strawberry, okay? When the tongue and the flavor meet, there is a consciousness of uh, tongue consciousness arises. When there, there is a tongue consciousness, what ha happens? Feeling arises. Now, feeling is understood as uh, uh, I like it, I don't like it, or neutral. That feeling is based on our, uh, that uh, has an aspect of perception in it. And that has an, uh, 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 has, a, uh, has a library of reactions. So after uh, the, there is a contact and the consciousness arises, the next is feeling. And the feeling when it arises, it has perception over there. Without perception, there is no feeling. Sensitivity. It is not consciousness. Sensitivity. The tongue sensitivity. Chitta Rupa. Yeah, but that is a and consciousness, that, uh, consciousness, consciousness that then, is there. Without consciousness, you cannot say there is a sensitivity. No, no. First the sensitivity, then consciousness. Finally, uh, what you say? We'll uh, we'll see, get the feeling. You have to be conscious to be conscious of that sensitivity. <laughs> yes. Well, conjoined. Conjoined, <laughs> they are not conjoined. disjoined. <laughs> that is what I'm saying. So they are conjoined, not disjoined. So at that point of time, the aspect of perception is also there. The feeling when it is there. It is like, I like it, I don't like it, I it's neutral. So that uh, it has, the, uh, at that point of time, that is already over there. Now, where do we come in is, we normally come in at the point of the arising of feeling when uh, he's a very advanced meditator. At the arising of feeling itself, uh, they uh, recognize there is a arising of feeling and then they will six or eight or arising at uh, the point of uh, craving, there is a tension and tightness which comes that time uh, the, uh, the uh, six are, or at the time of uh, the, uh, uh, after craving, there is a uh, thoughts of that uh, craving. So attachment, uh, when that at, at, uh, comes across that time, you can uh, let go or at the habitual tendencies. So there is a, a thing which happens, when you react to that, at the time of reaction, you recognize and six are, or you uh, uh, do it at the birth of action, when your mind is already uh, distracted. That time you recognize my mind is distracted, or your mind is distracted and that ha event has ended. That time you rec recognize and then you come back. So there is a point where uh, you can uh, do six are, yes. Here, along with the consciousness, the mental factors called the chetta sikha will arise, co arise along with the chitta, and they will bring the, the tendencies, the past tendencies or mud, whatever it is, the loba moha dosha, all such things will crop up, and finally, it will be in the shape of a feeling. It comes, yeah. So, that feeling has when the feeling comes up. That feeling is perceived as good, bad, or neutral. So that is when uh, that is when it, it, it is happening. Your past is coming at that point of time. But at any point of time, if your mindfulness is sharp enough, you will be able to let go. One person uh, can let go at the time of uh, the end, when the cycle has ended. He re recognizes at that point of time. And he comes back. He does six up. He recognizes, releases, relaxes, yeah. he smiles, and returns. Somebody who is more sharp. Everything. Than, uh, 
can everything uh, we are attached to kamma that uh, everybody is attached to kamma yeah we are attached to kamma is nothing but condition we are all conditioned in the and the 31 realms uh, we are all conditioned yeah condition the, once uh, that is condition means the condition comes because of the kamma after the kamma is established the javana chitta 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 in the shape of javana that impulse actions will start the impulse actions will be started in the shape of chitta by mental factors different mental factors and they co arise along with them and they perform the feelings and other things along with the consciousness correct so your consciousness of all these things so um, but depends on the volition that depends on our volition whether it is bodily or mentally or uh, uh, what is that uh, bodily mentally th third one right effort right effort has volition in it ah uh, that volition makes the difference that volition. so we may not come to know the entire heap of kamma but the volition by volition we can change it by cultivating the, uh, the by developing the insight and cultivating the mind into pure one that is what we are mending our that is what we are uh, changing our transforming our mind yeah we are taking our cultivating energy. cultivating a pure mind correct how are we doing i'm not bothered about my about my back side back side kamma which is a, a big heap i'm not bothered not bothered correct uh, but i am cultivating my mind and not to think of it and i am wholesome mind and making it a pure mind just correct. by volition the correct. volition is making the difference correct volition is, is nothing but intention are. Six R or right effort. <laughs> right effort. Intention. Intention making it wholesome. Yes. <laughs> that is six R by six R. Yes. <laughs> I'm not bothered about the kamma, whatever it is there in my back. Correct. But that is making me to come into the picture with the help of kamma. That uh, kamma with the impulsive action is coming and talking to you. Now with the wholesome mind, I am changing my mind into a pure mind, cultivating the mind. Correct. With the help of insight, what what is developed because of this talk or others, whoever is helped me to change it from my earlier time. So one can realize what has happened now is based on the past. So what does one does now will create the future. So that one realizes. <laughs> Very good. Okay, then uh, is there anything else? Then we can end it now. <laughs> okay, then we'll end with a sharing of merit. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the giving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu. Very good. And uh, we, uh, I think Wednesday, uh, Sister Kema will be there once again. She was a little uh, uh, not well today, but uh, I think she will join us in Wednesday. Okay, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Bandi. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>